disease that caused his death. Caroline could not be comforted. At her funeral years later, Bishop Schmid said, Aunt Carrie, Carrie's spirit wilted like a flower droops its head in the blazing sun in the desert. She was never the same after the death of her son. Aunt Carrie's health deteriorated rapidly after George's death and she never took her family back to the Slug Creek Dairy. The dairying operation was continued in Bern after that. By the time the Slug Creek Dairy ceased operation in 1903, Caroline had finished adding to her family. David Charles would have been 22 years old, still single. Ida Caroline, born October 7, 1883, would have been 20 years old and still single. Seth Noah, born the 21st of June, 1885, would have been 18 years old and still single. George Warner, born February of 1887, would have been 15 years old. He unfortunately died February 3rd, 1903. Charlotte Julina, born the 5th of January, 1889, would have been 14 years old. Adeline Ellen, born the 3rd, June 3rd of 1890, would have been 13 years old. Lydia Amalia, born July 10th, 1892, would have been 11 years old. Then Caroline added a set of twins to the family. Franklin Frederick, born April 7th, 1894, and Seymour Samuel, born the same day. Although the younger children would be limited in what they could do, everyone helped. Everyone did something. Then on September 22, 1897, Anthon Ulrich was born. Magdalena Rosina was born on January 29, 1899, and the last daughter of Caroline and Christian was born March 31, 1900, just three years before the Slug Creek Dairy closed. I found it interesting that all of Caroline's children were born at Bern, regardless of the month of the year. Then in 1905, Christian entered into a contract with the state of Idaho to build the Thunder Bluff Road from Paris to Franklin. It was represented to him by the county surveyor to be a plow road, but when they got to that portion that is called the German Dugway, they found that that whole section had to be blasted and much rock moved by hand. The project was a $2,300 contract that required Christian to post a bond. When the men working for the Christian on the road heard rumors of financial failure, they all quit despite the high wages he was paying. Robert, his brother, was working for him as a blaster. When Christian was having a hard time completing this project because of the German dugway requiring so much blasting, his son David Charles was successful in getting the state engineer to approve a change in the course of the road, and another of his sons, Seth Noah, did the surveying. The change required that the road not have any slope greater than 10%. When the state engineer checked the new route, he found that it did not contain any slopes greater than 10%. With the help of his family, Christian was able to finish the project which turned out not to be very profitable, and the state of Idaho released his bond. With a crew of 10 to 12 men needed to complete the job, Christian and Eliza's daughter, Nellie, was assigned as the camp cook. Nellie became lonely after several weeks, so she convinced Christian that she needed a helper. For whatever the reason, Nellie picked Zina 
who was only five years old, to be that helper. Zina, in her book, The Hills of Burn, gives some interesting first-hand stories of this road-building adventure. Zina relates that on the first trip out to the camp, while they were resting having lunch, it sounds from the description to be by the Paris Ice Cave, there suddenly came a terrible ferocious sound from the wagon box that to all who heard it found it terribly unsettling. The noise ended abruptly with what sounded like a rifle shot causing the horses to bolt. Once the horses had been retrieved by the twins and they investigated the sound and found that a bottle of yeast bread start that Aunt Eliza had sent to Nellie was laying in the wagon box absorbing heat in the sunlight until the container was compromised and simply finally exploded. Zina relates that while she was the cook's helper at camp, old Rudolph somehow saw a need for a doll, so he took a forked maple stick and carved Chowy, a five-year-old ver old's version of what everybody else called Charlie. Old Rudolph was old because he was young Rudolph's dad. This lets one, familiar with the people around Bern, know that Rudolph Bentz was working for Christian on that road project. I knew young Rudolph as a kid growing up. Zina tells that she and Nellie slept in the white top buggy which had canvas side enclosures that gave them some privacy away from the main camp with the back pushed up against a tree. One night Nellie woke Zina because a large critter was on top of the white top and was making some commotion. The two girls were frightened and they aroused the camp by screaming for all they were worth. By the time the men showed up, the critter was gone, but Nellie would not be calmed until the white top was moved closer to the corner of the sleeping tent where Christian slept. Sina describes the thunderstorms as being loud and violent. She recalled how they were cold and miserable and during those times everyone seemed uncomfortable. Apparently the building of the Thunder Bluff Road was just a one summer project. Christian completed the project and the state of Idaho paid him and released his bond. Zina shed some light on life as it was in and around the burn area at that time as she tells some other family stories. She tells of Aunt Eliza wanting her to go to the school with a message of an organ lesson change for Nellie. The school was down in Lower Burn on Church House Hill, some two miles from home. Zina would not have been s six years old. This was the dead of winter, and it took some convincing before Caroline consented. Zina was bundled and then taking her brother's store-bought sleigh, she set out. Christian was watching from the barnyard. Before Zina reached the sand hill, a wolf had spotted her and was watching and circling her. Christian was watching from the yard, very concerned, but recognized because of the snow conditions, he would be unable to assist her on horseback and because of the distance, he couldn't assist her with rifle shots. When Zina reached the sand hill, she mounted the sleigh and sped away with the wolf retreating and going toward the outlet, still in Christian's view. She made the schoolhouse in safety. Zina tells of the winter that her uncle Will died. Will had an infected tooth and died from blood poisoning on November 12th 1905. Rule Victor said the family had moved into and was living in the John Peter Alleman home in Prescadero, just below Lower Burn. John Peter Alleman had married David and Louisa's daughter, Lula Rosina Kuntz, on November 2, 1904, 
just months after returning from his mission to Germany on July 2, 1904. John Peter and Lulu Rosina were living at Raymond, Idaho after their marriage because Lula Rosina died on March 21, 1905 of black measles at Raymond only five months after their marriage. Zina tells that Aunt Eliza and Christian and Caroline called at the Will and Mary Ann's home in Pescadero at the time of Will's death. Zina gives us some insight into Christian's character when she relates how on his way to Utah to obtain work in the mines at the beginning of winter, he came across an ill-prepared outlaw headed in the same direction. As soon as Christian evaluated the man's situation and lack of preparation, he took control of the situation and by sharing with that which he had including his knowledge and experience, was able to keep the outlaw alive even at the peril of his own life and safe trip. When later being chided about putting himself at risk for a common outlaw, Christian responded that he still wanted to sleep at night and be able to live with himself. Ziner relates an incident where a beggar came to the door of her mother's house and was begging for things to eat and especially cash. Caroline informed him that she could feed him and give him bread and eggs, but she didn't have any money, none. Then she recalled that there was a dime that belonged to Zina in a cup in the cupboard. Finally, she took the dime from the cup and gave the beggar, telling Zina that she would replace it. Zina describes the fit of rage that she threw as a child and finally how her mother was able to calm her by offering to fry an egg for her in butter. That offer settled Zina and she calmed at once. I found it very interesting that one egg fried in butter was considered such a treat by Zina that it emotionally settled her at once. These were dairy people. They fried with butter. Butter was plentiful. Chickens were part of every ho home and barnyard. Eggs were a big part of their diet. I found it surprising that an egg fried in butter was prized so highly. Zina said to get an egg fried in butter other than on a birthday was a very rare occasion. Christian's daring operations become limited to the cows that his deeded pasture would support in North Burn once the Slug Creek dairy operation was shut down in 1903. The dairying slowly gave way to the raising of large wheat and barley and alfalfa fields. As the land was cleared and put in grains and alfalfa, there was no fences between the pasture land and the grain fields so family members, usually the younger children, were required to herd the cows to keep them in the pastures. Finally, the grain fields got so large that the old binder became inadequate and Christian bought a new header machine. It was one of the first ones in Bear Lake County. As more and more of the land was cleared for grain fields, Christian began planning and doing projects for irrigating tracts of his land. It was the intent of irrigating a field below the sand hill that he and his sons were digging an irrigation ditch across the sand hill when they dug up some large bones. Henry's place became the George Kuntz place and was so for about 50 years. About halfway between that intersection at Henry's place and the Lower Burn Road on the north side of the road is what was, has always been called the Sand Hill. Christian Kuntz owned the Sand Hill as it was part of the holdings that he originally bought from Apostle Charles Rich for 20 head of steers. One day in 1911 as Christian and some of his sons were digging an irrigation trench by hand through that area. 
they came across some large teeth. The article in the Salt Lake Tribune described each tooth as being over a foot long and about as wide. Christian immediately contacted Dr. James E. Talmage of the Deseret Museum of Salt Lake City who immediately came to the site and unearthed enough of the bones to determine that the skeleton was that of an unusually large mammoth. The animal was estimated to be about 30 feet in length and stood high enough that a modern day elephant could have walked under his stomach. Dr. Talmage sealed a deal with Christian Kuntz, securing the skeletal remains for the Deseret Museum for the amount Ziner recorded in her writings as being $100. Dr. Talmage declared that the large skeleton was one of the most valuable of its kind that had been unearthed in this country. Christian and both of his wives had strong testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Though Christian himself never served a mission, he and his wives felt that any of their sons and daughters that were called would have the opportunity to serve. Christian Wilford, Christian and Eliza's fourth child and oldest living son, was born on November 10, 1878. He was attending the Utah State Agricultural College in Logan when he met and married Charlotte Susanna Hall on June 12, 1901. Between 1901 and 1907, Christian Wilford and Lottie, as she was called, lived in Logan, Ogden, and Huntsville, and spent the summers in Idaho on the Hall Ranch, a ranch owned by Lottie's dad. Christian Wilford was called to serve a mission in Germany in April 1907, 